Okay, so how's everybody doing? All right, then just a couple of things I want to preface with before I um, commence this episode. Um, I just want to put a shout out to those who are uh, afflicted with illnesses right now or family crisis or poverty issues, financial. Um, I know that it happens to people out there and I want you to know that I think about you and uh, I covet you in my prayers. I pray that God's uh, grace and deliverance would be upon you, that he'll help you even for those that have uh, chronic illnesses, that um, uh, you'll be encouraged and and able to cope and overcome um, you know maybe you can't even get out even though it's not COVID related but uh, you have this hobby right and uh, having a health issue can kind of take the wind out of the sails there and I I understand that because I've gone through it many times myself um, and uh, by God's grace I've been able to overcome and, and uh, still enjoy the hobby that we all share Okay, so uh, before I go on with the install on this uh, CNGP40-2, I just want to talk about my humble fleet, really, um, that I presently have right now and have built up since May of 2020. And for those of you that don't know, um, I began with this Atlas-8 uh, 40B unit, 4-axle, uh, and I installed a TCS sound decoder in it with uh, two TCS Wow Sound 28 millimeter speakers. And when I did that, I was like really impressed. I thought, wow, does that ever sound good? And they're mounted in this typical A-frame Atlas early chassis model, which come with these. Uh, as you know or may not know, the new, newer Atlas ones, even if it's the same model, are completely different. Uh, they've gotten away from this now, but I'll talk about that later. And then I uh, built up this uh, SD38 AC unit, uh, part of Southern British Columbia Rail Link, as these other three are, from a Cato chassis, a Cannon Company cab, an Atlas long hood from a Jeep 35. Eight, I think, or anyway, it was a real mishmash of kit bash parts, and it turned out better than I thought, and I really like it. It's a really good runner with a Cato drive. So that's TCS as well, except it has two sugar cube speakers mounted in a custom enclosure. So we got two TCS units. One has twin 28 millimeter TCS WOW speakers in an open A frame. This one has two. Sugar cube speakers mounted in an airtight facing in speaker enclosure. And they both sound really good, but I would have to say that this unit sounds a little more crisp and throatier than this uh, Dash 8 here. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Now these two I decided to go with Loke Sound. This is a Walther's kit bashed. I got it on deck but it was a dynamic hood which I kit bashed. You'll see in the some earlier content and I really like this model. For the money this is my favorite locomotive. Uh, people overlook these but you know it's too bad because there's so much potential uh, if you're a GP9 fan because this is the old proto long hood here and some other parts as well and it's the, really good if you super detail but anyway that this one also has two sugar cube speakers mounted face down in a custom built enclosure and it's sounded even better than these two so i was really uh chomping at the bit for the next one on that and I decided that I would do this MP15 which was originally an Atlas Gold. It was the only one I could find at the time and I had an, sorry Amtrak fans, but an ugly silver livery. I stripped that in isopropyl alcohol, stripped it all down and just re and read the whole locomotive and what I did was is you'll see in the MP15 build up that I re and read the long hood quite a bit here to get as much space for a speaker enclosure as I could and then this is an open great uh, fan or air intake here and 
which might explain why this, in my opinion, sounds better than all of these locomotives. Uh, except the jury's out on this yet when I build this one up. but And I don't understand why totally. Like they're airtight just like these three. Yet it's the smallest enclosure of all three. Um, now the decoders varied. Like this is TCS. But these are two Loke Sound version 5. So if I compare this one fairly to this one with the larger speaker enclosure. I have to say that this M MP15 uh, sounds more throatier. Now that might be due to the quality of the recording because I think that plays in as well with this pursuit of uh, prototypical sound that we all like to chase. And I know that sound right now is still evolving and I and I'm, uh, like being part of that process, like trying to squeeze out the best sound that we can. But I was really surprised with this uh, unit here. And it caused me to rethink things. And now maybe it's because of this open grill here too. The sound, like there's so much going on with physics. Like I don't know, like I'm not an a, a electrician or a sound technician. You know, I'm just an artist that just experiments with things, right? And likes to take risks uh, to achieve, you know, results. And that's the, the part of the modeling process that I really enjoy. So I don't know. So out of these four locomotives, I would have to say that this one here impresses me the most. Then I would say the GP9 does. And then probably the SD38. And then the BC rail with these two TCS wild 28 millimeter speakers. But I think that's going to change though when I install the same two speakers in this airtight enclosure with a low sound version 5 and the recording. Okay. Okay, so let's continue on from part one then in the revision that we make to the A-frame speaker enclosure. So those of you, for those of you that uh, watched part one, uh, you know that um, I cut four gaskets and uh, they spec out at 30 millimeters because this opening is, is 30 millimeters and we need to cut these gaskets in, in order to accommodate these 28 millimeter TCS wow sound speakers, which are excellent, by the way. Um, but I've yet to find out what they're like in an airtight enclosure. I have two mounted in the Dash 8, as I mentioned earlier, in the, which they sound pretty good, but I'm hoping they're going to sound even more bassier 
and with a different recording with the turbocharger and the GP40-2, I think. Uh, they'll really enhance that sound range. Okay, so what I've done was is I dry fit these into this frame on both sides before I install this inner sleeve. And then I used thin CA. This is stuff's like water. Be careful with this stuff. Man, it can, it, it'll go everywhere and it's hot. It has a chemical reaction and generates a lot of heat, but it makes a really good bond for low tolerances for tight fitting parts when it comes to plastic to metal or wood to metal or vice versa. Okay, so that's how I glued these and I just ran a bead to capillary around, capillary around. Now, I need to mention to you about, because I did say in the first part that you could probably use thin CA to mount this curved plate here, which is under a bit of tension when you push it in, right? Even though you round it over the pencil. Uh, do not use thin CA for that. Um, I tried it twice and both times it deformed this plastic and it cracked and split. So I had to peel it off both times and re and re this and redo it. So what I used was five, five minute epoxy, right? And then I just shoved the piece in there that's, that's proud on the bottom and sides. Like don't cut it exact size. Just slide a proud piece in, bend it in, and then hold it for five minutes till it sets up. And then where these little strips were, as you know from part one, those were CA to the metal. I put a little bead of CA on the corners there just to anchor that bottom extra strength. And then I cut away towards the frame with a really sharp number 11 blade. I, I nibbled it away with nippers first because I don't want to pop that. I mean, you still can, right? Even though it's a pretty good bond, but you don't want to do that because you want to keep it airtight. And then I just cleaned it up, you know, with a file and stuff too, right? So she's nice and flush. And then before I, uh, this goes into here, I just need to show you one other important modification I had to do. Okay, so in order for this revised A-frame to go back into the main chassis frame, you have to remove, there's a little metal tab right here uh, that was initially there to fit inside this 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 front part of the a-frame just to sort of center it and secure it but you don't need it and I'll, and I'll show you why because there's locating pins right here metal locating pins already on this unit plus two screws and it's locked into the edge of this there's a a uh, little return on the frame here built in so it locks in regardless of whether you have that tab or not why it's there is beyond me maybe it was part of a initial concept and design. I don't know because this chassis has been revised over the years. But this is why I like Atlas because especially the older ones, they were over-engineered in so many ways, which is makes them great for revisions like this. So anyway, I used a pair of needle nose vice grips just to grab a hold of that tab. I want to avoid getting the Dremel out and grinding if, if I can help it. And you just rock it back and forth. It'll just snap right off, clean. And now the frame, the revised frame, will drop right in nice, okay? Okay, so after having done that little modification by removing that tab, now this A-frame fits really nice in the chassis. Two screws go in the bottom there. It fits snug. Two metal locating pins. And uh, what we have here is a nice uh, airtight A-frame enclosure prepped up, right? And then these speakers now will fit nicely in there like this, see? One on each side. But look at the space in here. Nice cavity, eh? I'm hoping that's going to help create a little more of that uh, booming bass effect with the pressure that it's going to seek to try to equalize on the outside of this A-frame within the uh, long hood as well, which also helps with a, a more sort of uh, bassy reverb. It's all, it's, 
it's all about risk and experimentation, right? You never know what you're going to get at the end of the day. Uh, so uh, this is why we do it, because on such a small micro scale, uh, it's just not as easy to implement a technology on a really micro scale as it is to a you know, large stereo speaker in your home, for example. It's much easier to apply uh, methods and procedures and test the results. Sorry, I just need to insert this. So when I glue these gaskets to this particular speaker here, I need to point out that there's a small black like gasket already built onto this speaker. It's, it's a type of foam, right? And so I'm putting this rigid plastic and I'm using this particular glue by Model Master. It's called Clear Part Cement and Window Maker. It's at every hobby shop now, pretty much. Model Master Clear Parts Cement and Window Maker, which is the same as this one I used to use for RC canopies back in the day. This Formula A 560 canopy glue. It's the same stuff, really. All right, so you can use either or. And the reason why I use this is because it has a rubbery texture when it dries, so it'll still act as a sort of a shock absorbing gasket, right? Because there's a reason why they have that there, because these diaphragms, they really pump. You know, they really put, pump out these speakers. They're 1.5 watts, right? 1.5 watts. And they're 8 ohm. So in, in parallel, they become 4 ohm. Which the Loc Sound version 5 can handle. It can handle up from anywhere from 4 ohm to... Uh, 16 ohm or more uh, i'm not really sure and it and the low sound version 5 decoder puts out two watts right so combining these together you know like you're right in the ballpark there so okay clear part cement and then uh when they get attached to the a-frame i'm just going to push them in because they fit nice and tight dry like they, they pop in nice after you clean them up with a nail file just make sure they fit in good and then i'm going to clear part cement this gap here uh, and so if I need to remove them I can just knife it out and then remove the speaker wow they got nice magnets too now I just want to mention why I'm going with these speakers and I want to show you that you can also use sugar cubes as well and they come with little speaker enclosure parts that you can build these up and what I did there was I just used a bit of uh, evergreen plastic scrap so I can slide it over the uh, the rear here like that you can mount one like that too and then you can mount the other one right here on the front if you want if you want to mount it that way on a similar chassis so there's other options that you can do but I'm going to go with this, uh, uh, this uh, TCS 28 millimeter round speakers because there's no way that that this little speaker has the same potential as this speaker if if the equivalency is done in terms of speaker enclosure. And what I mean by that is these are have superior magnets in them, and they have and they're larger. And uh, we know that the larger the speaker, the better they are, right? In most cases. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing it. And I'll be glad to share that with you. Okay. And then, um, oh yeah, for the soundboard, I just use screws that I keep, right? We all should, you know, acquire a box of these after a while. Uh, I think I acquired about half a dozen screws off this frame that I won't be needing. Small screws like this that I can use to mount boards with and so that will work for that and then with this long hood frame this uh, cab is glued to this long like this is all one piece including this chassis part I like to mount them as one piece I don't like to have to line things up and in this case I cut out some of the bulkhead here and I removed the cab I'm not going to have a cab in here I don't care about detailing cabs I've done it before they don't show anyway unless you're going to enter it in a juried show to me it doesn't really matter and I get more airspace in there. So, but I just wanted to clean that out because it has to accommodate the little bit longer board in there. Okay. 
And then just in closing then, so here's what this speaker application is going to look like. It's going to be inside this airtight, well it's more of an A-frame like this. And then you have the two speakers, oh here let me redraw that. So you have this A-frame like this, and then we got two speakers that are going to play off each other. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do. You know, they're both going to be pounding out sound at each other. There's a term for this. And I can't remember what it is, but ultimately this sound created in here has to equalize with the outside, right? That's, that's how speaker physics works. So even if it's airtight, it's going to find a way out and it's going to find a way to equalize. So that's kind of the theory behind this airtight enclosure facing the speakers in. And they sound pretty good. Even though I've heard there's a, a person on YouTube that's done this. I'll try to le uh, leave a link down below on a GP9 where they faced speakers uh, in a box like this. And they're sugar cubes. And uh, he faced them out. And it sounds fantastic. So... Each to his own, right? Anyway, thanks for tuning in and uh, looking forward to the next episode, which should be a sound test. And uh, we'll see how she goes, okay? So I hope you have a great day.